Private Lender Podcast, Episode 61. The Private Lender Podcast quote of the day comes to us from Peter Lynch, who said, In the long run, it's not just how much money you make that will determine your future prosperity. It's how much of that money you put to work by saving it and investing it. This is the Private Lender Podcast, the show that shares practical advice and know-how for new and seasoned lenders, from private mortgages on single-family houses to joint ventures on commercial projects and beyond. Discover details about investment vehicles that you won't find at your local bank or online broker. Listen and learn from private lenders and real estate investors, as well as from professionals and entrepreneurs, as they share the details, strategies, and the insight that allows for successful and prosperous lending. Now, get ready to increase your ROI. Here's your host, Keith Baker. Hello there, and welcome to the Private Lender Podcast. I'm your host, Keith Baker, and I want to thank you for sharing your time with me today. This is going to be episode number 61, and it's the first that I am releasing after my three-week hiatus, after throwing out my back, getting really busy at work, and just having life decide that I needed to do other things besides doing a podcast. So, I'm back. Thanks for hanging in there. Thanks for listening and sticking in there, waiting for me. Today's episode is going to be, for the first time, what I did was a Q&A session at Mitch Stevens' bus tour back in 2018 in October. And I grabbed the audio from it because I, I want to share it with you. It's best when you know these questions just come from real life events or stages, or in this case, it was a breakfast room at a hotel in San Antonio. But I like it because I think there's a lot of value in there for you already, and it's already done, and this is a great way to come back out of my hay just without you know jumping in too, too much. But I am getting more and more episodes out there ready for you, locked and loaded on the weekly basis. So let's go ahead and get into the Q&A session I did at the Mitch Stephen Bus Tour. I uh, wanted to uh, introduce myself, introduce the podcast and what I'm trying to do. You guys can do while you're chewing on your tacos. That's not a problem. But then I would like a little bit of feedback because what I'm trying to do with the podcast and, and my online course is getting people trained up and ready to be private lenders for you and for people like Mitch. So really, I don't even need 25 minutes. I think I've just said the elevator speech right there. But to give you a little background, I started the Private Lender Podcast January 1st of this year. Episode 41 will go out, uh, be released tomorrow. Mitch was on episode number six. Thank you very much, Mr. Mitch. Wow. And the way this all came about was I have a day job that I actually like. I do insurance adjusting for the oil field. So I don't deal with homes. I don't deal with autos. I don't deal with feelings or soft tissues. None of that. I deal with oil field equipment, big money, large item stuff. And one day when I was walking out of Lloyd's of London and being impressed at how, wow, how cool that is, I realized, man, I handle a lot of other people's money, a lot of it, and uh, almost as much as Mitch. But I love my day job, and there's a lot of promise with that. I have a little equity in the company that I work for, but I wanted to stay involved in real estate, and the only way, or the best way I could do that was through private lending. I get to stay around with, with heavy hitters, people who do it every day. I get to learn from them, whether they want to teach me or not. Oftentimes, I'll make them hold my hand and walk me through their transaction. I got a call from a guy who I used to loan a lot of money to who said, hey, look, I'm switching over to wholesaling. I don't need money, but my friend Landon needs a private lender. So one of the first things that Landon asked me was, have you ever heard of Mitch Steven? No. Who's that? Well, long story short, Landon and I started an LLC, and now we do owner financing out of that LLC. But it all started with a private lending contact. And now I don't loan to the LLC because I do most of my lending out of my self-directed IRA. So I like to sleep at night. I like to keep things above board and very transparent. So I don't loan to the LLC that we do our owner financing with. But doesn't mean we can't use other people's money, other people's IRAs. So anyway, so fast forward to about this time last year or, or September, I was forced to take a family vacation to the beach. I'm not a beach person. I'm a mountain guy. But when you have a wife and two daughters that love sunshine, you do what you have to do. So while I was miserable and destined, the, the idea struck me to start the podcast and start bringing, you know, Mitch, I know, does a, bust his tail, and probably a lot of you guys do, trying to find private money. And I'd like to bridge that gap and be able to get people who aren't necessarily versed in real estate, who aren't going to go out and flip or landlord, but might have that 401k or an IRA sitting around, or hey, maybe they got lucky 
and inherited some cash, but they can put it to work. And so what I'd like to do is bring everybody together and create essentially an economy by which we don't need banks and we don't need stock market brokers, Wall Street brokers getting paid. I mean, look, I'm not going to begrudge anybody for getting paid, but when you're, you're losing my money, why should I pay you a bonus? That's the way I look at it. So Amen. it's a meritocracy. That's why I like private lending so much because I can kind of pick and choose who I work with or the students of the gurus. I get to choose them who I work with as well. And so what I really want to do today is everyone's pretty much done eating. Oh, I'll give a dollar if anyone eats a whole jalapeno right now. <laughs> Anybody not from Texas? Anybody not from Texas? Too late. Too late. Oh, too late. <laughs> too late. All right, so I got a dollar. Two dollars. Okay, all right. I owe two dollars then. Still, yeah, they're not that hot. I love them. I love No, I love Oh, they're great. They're very, very mild. All right, I got a 10 spot for that. <laughs> Anyway, so kicked off the podcast. It got going slowly, but there's been traction little by little, getting more and more episodes or downloads every month, getting more and more interaction with people. And so that is going to lead to hopefully in January, the Private Lender Academy, which is going to be the funnel to bring in your dentists, your orthodontists, your people with money who want to invest and help put things to work in your projects. We're going to start that in an online community. And then hopefully by this time next year, we'll be talking about having functions with Mitch and other folks of bringing everybody together so that you can introduce yourselves and your businesses to private lenders and negotiate the terms. Because that's the other beautiful thing. Everything's negotiable. Everything. Nothing's taken for granted. It's not like walking into a bank, as you know, I'm sure you guys know a lot of. So that's what I'd like to do is bring these two groups together, create this economy. And what I'm looking for from you guys this morning, besides indigestion, is what are your pain points? What are you guys struggling with when it comes to private lending? Is it finding private lenders? Is it it convincing them? What yeah, if you could please tell me. Convincing private lenders. I know people have money, that have money, but it's convincing them because they're skeptical about it. And I don't have enough credibility. Okay, are they skeptical of, is it you or is it is your process? Process of doing the owner finance and, and having them fund the first lien? Uh, not sure. Not sure, okay. May I chime in? I think it's the insecurity of your part because you don't think that you deserve the money or you don't have the track record or... Why would anyone loan to me? But you can get over that because it's not about you, it's about the deal. You just need to explain to them that it's, they need to realize that, it's, that they even need to realize that it's not about you, it's about the deal. You're either going to get paid this amount of money or you're going to get this house. And this is how much you have involved. You don't want, if that's not a value to you or you don't see how you're protected with that, then don't do this. It's really pretty cut and dried. It's almost like I don't even, I'm not going to force someone or talk someone into doing it. Right. If they don't see it, I just leave them alone and go to the next one. Yeah. Because you start getting into trouble when you start pushing round pegs into square holes, you know? But the other thing I want to address is he said a really key word, create your own economy. That's how I learned to boom. I had my own economy, and during the recession, I didn't need a bank. I didn't need anyone to support me except the team that I had built, which was my private lenders and my buyers and my sellers. So it's about creating your own economy. Write that down. You have to create your own economy from the very beginning to the end. So that when there's a slowdown or there's a bump in the road for everyone else, doesn't affect you. And I think we're coming up, Manhattan luxury real estates had four consecutive quarters of decline. So there are some potential signs writing on the wall that you know, we may be coming in for the next market cycle, the next correction. And guess what, you know, what happened in 09? Who was lending money in 09? Not banks. Nope. No, it wasn't banks, it was private lenders. And so that's part of my job is to get people over the hump to see that this is a good deal, that their money is going to be protected. Yes, there's risk in everything. Just read any prospectus from Schwab or Fidelity. But you can mitigate that risk, and I'm trying to get people over that hump to where when they come to you, they're ready to go. If they're comfortable with the deal, then they'll move forward, and then everybody gets happy. And I'm glad you said that. One of the main things is you can't guarantee anything. You can't have the word guarantee in anything you say. There is no guarantee. The whole United States can be knocked off the planet if there's a nuclear war. So I mean, there's no guarantee. That's how you have That's, to look at it. Yeah. So when you tell people, I have an investment with a minimal risk or a, a very – nice risk reward situation you know mm-hmm. that's how you would start to phrase it you know yeah it's, um, we have security backing up your loan you know there's a security yeah. yeah this is one of the only investments that is secured by real estate and insurance policies title insurance property and after harvey flood <laughs> i require on any note that i originate or have touch i require flood insurance from the national flood insurance program if somebody's going to say 450 bucks is going to kill my deal then it's not a deal 
and you don't need to be lending on it, or you probably shouldn't be getting into that deal anyway. So, I mean, that's my opinion. But from a lending perspective, that's where I come from with the flood insurance side of things. Yes. Credit lending. How do you find them? How do you get their attention? How do you stand in front of them? And once you do, what's your script? What do you talk about? That's a good question, and my answer is constantly evolving because I was the guy who went to RIA meetings for three years and sat back there and never opened up my mouth. And now that I've started the podcast, I can't shut up, it seems like. So I go to meetings like this. I go to RIA meetings all over here. I'm from the Houston area, so I go to as many RIA meetings as I can. I go to every single Quest IRA event that I can. And any other self-directed IRA custodian out there, I know there's you know a few Quest is the hometown guy for me, so that's why I stick with them so much. And I got my start with them. So uh, hence my loyalty, but I go to those meetings and I'll just chat with people and I won't go into, heard this great analogy. When you go to a singles bar, you're not direct. You don't walk up and tell you know, exactly what you want. No, you have to go around it. So I don't talk about private lending. I don't talk about real estate. I talk about what they do and their family and what they want to do, how they want to secure their future. And then lead that into, you know, have you thought about private lending? Because it's not for everybody. It's definitely not for everybody. And the first time somebody takes a, a chunk of money and, and hands it to you for, you know, three to five years. Yeah, I don't care how solid the paperwork is. That's still a, a gut feeling. So I would start just building rapport. I wouldn't even touch the topic of private lending at first. See where their mindsets are and you can go from there and then you know, lead them into that situation because you don't want to take a guy who drives a Cadillac and make him drive a Pinto, right? You know, so you, you got to kind of know your audience and I do it on an individual basis. Like Mitch was real easy. He's been doing it for so long. Like I was, plus his student was telling me how great he is. So then I saw it work and I saw the numbers come in and they're still coming in. And I'm like, this is good stuff. Thank you, Mr. Mitch. 100% of my clients are investors. And mm-hmm. when I talk about private lending to them, their biggest fear is lending me $30,000 on a property because it's such a small amount mm-hmm. that in their eyes, 8% of $30,000 is peanuts, right? Correct. How do you fix that situation? Very simple. I'll put it to you this way. When I first started private lending, I only did six-month loans, and I wanted a minimum of 12%. But then I was working every five months trying to find another deal to put that into so that my money would just consistently run. So the owner financing model now for three years, I'm going to get my 8% and I don't have to work my money. All I do is check at the first of the month that the payment has come in and that's it. How hard do they want to work for that is what it boils down to. As you can see, I'm very lazy. The only thing I really like to do is eat. So that's all I want to do. Like Once I do my due diligence, once I underwrite and vet, say, your project, I want to set it and forget it. I want to go Ron to appeal all the way for those three years or however, five years, however long we've got our terms for. I want to do that. So ask them, how hard do you want to work? Or do you want to do it one time? And for the next three years, you're going to get consistent return. Or that could be one time in the 10 years or 15 or yeah. People that have 30 years to go before their IRA matures and says, man, I just want to set it and forget it. Yeah. It's I want to go so, back and forth. So, so we said, well, how about a 15 year? You can pay 10% if you get a 25 year AM or a 20 year AM, you know? Yeah. It's not all about the rate. Sometimes it's about the term. And it depends on what the person that you're talking to wants. Yes. Most of my people are older, so I do 8% interest only five years. But I start talking to some of the younger people. They might just want to set it and forget it. So you want to do yeah. well, You could do a 20-year balloon with a five-year call. Or, you know, they yeah. can do anything you can think of that's fixed. It's all negotiable, yeah. yeah. You did so well, I forgot what I was going to say. But uh, no, that's all right. If someone wants a shorter turnaround or they want the higher yield, then I wouldn't fish in that pond with them. Introduce them to a rehabber, a flipper. And, you know, tell me, look, if you change your mind, if you want to do this, or when you get tired of spending your wheels free money, come talk to me. And that's how I kind of weed those people out. Because I spent a lot of time trying to convince people who were only locked in on 14%. That, no, 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 you can do this. It's great. You know, you're going to just spinning your wheels and just, you know, identify them. And then it's okay. Maybe a rehab is better for you. But you look for the people like Mitch is talking about who want to do the set it and forget it. So even the people say no, they're stuck on the 14%. Say, you just send them an email with your funding opportunity. Maybe you got a house worth 100 that you're picking up for 45 You say, just want to show you the kind of deals that I yeah. offer for 8%. Look at this. It's a 45% LTV. I mean, how do you get burned on that? Yeah. You, know? and you just send it out. So you just want to show you. Kind of just keep dinging them once every month or once a quarter. Not too much. Just every now and then when a super stellar deal comes by, pick one of the people that told you. you know, say, hey, just want to show you what happened this week. Yeah. Got a, got a guy loaning on this deal here. And that'll work. Those drip campaigns will actually wear them down slowly but surely. Yes, sir. So just to maybe add value to the group, our company is called USA Private Money. Okay. All right? And so we wrote a little ebook called Flip Your Capital. Mm-hmm. So many people can't find flips, and they go through this training, education, and so forth. And we've got kind of an unfair advantage because we speak at those events. 
but we were able to raise $10 million in 18 months with this little ebook. And all of you can go take this ebook off our website, and it's the 14 reasons why banks loan money on real estate and why you should too. So if you come across as the expert, they're going to, and if you take, create your own little ebook and come across as the expert, and we take a little different approach, we are bold about it. You can't find a house you want to flip? How about flipping your capital? Let's put your money to work. I think flippers are a fantastic place to go. What's the name of the website? Let's get the website and I'll repeat it back on the mic. So you can go to flip your capital, but or you can get to it at USA Private Money. In the middle of our webpage, it says flip your capital. Click that or flipyourcapital.com. USAPrivateMoney.com or flipyourcapital.com. Right. Okay, one of those two websites. Great. Excellent. Thank you. That's a great guide to help people. Say, did I hear you say we have permission to yeah, use that well, book? Go, go take the ebook and create your own ebook. Or yeah. I mean, you, I'd be happy for you to promote our ebook. But <laughs> sure. Is, is that we don't have any trademark on the fourteen reasons why people put money to work, right? Right. Yeah. And that does provide a lot of value in adding to you because you're giving somebody value up front. You're changing their mindset up front with that ebook, and obviously, it's successful. But that averages out a month, but it's a lot more than a dollar. So you're saying about the success of that book, because I came up with the idea like a month and a half ago, I need to write that book myself. So I'm just about finished with that book. But it was just how to become a passive lender using real estate as collateral. That's, I mean, my life in a thousand houses, how to become a passive real estate investor using real estate as collateral. Because I really want to explain it. Part of the challenges, though, in the book was, like, there's all these different ways that you can set up a loan. And I just had to pick one way. And, like, <laughs> yeah. Not complicated too much, right? So before yep. you publish it, go pick up Bob Z's book. He just put it out. It's a fantastic read that you're going to want to read through before you put yours out. Yeah, and I'm, I think I read yours too. What is his name, Bob? Bob Zachmeyer. Zachmeyer? Zachmeyer, yeah. He's got a new book out called Who Needs the Bank. Yep. It's been on Facebook. He just launched it here recently. But the biggest thing, and I think you'll agree, is you have to put up the numbers. It's a sales game. It's just the same as anything else. I challenge all my students all the time. I bet you can't present to 50 people in a row, even as an amateur, and get 50 no's in a row. Your challenge is to get 50 no's in a row. The question is, who in this room is actually going to go for that 50? I bet you you can't make it to 15. But I'll guarantee you, you can't make it to 50. So if you set your goal to get 50 no's in a row, I bet you can't do it. He just said guarantee coming from the guy who said never guarantee. Well, so that's I how, wasn't guaranteeing that's someone's how, money. No, it wasn't guaranteed. but that's how powerful that statement is, though. Do 50, get your 50 no's, yeah, and it won't happen. You can't get 50 no's, <clears throat> and it won't happen. Yeah, so okay. I learned this from Dan Kennedy. Mm -hmm. You guys know. Yeah, the king of kings. So Dan basically said, if you want to be seen as the expert, claim it. And the mm -hmm. quickest way... To claim it is to write a book. Yep. And so we wrote this ebook, and I would tell you go out and figure out how to put together an ebook. And when you look at ours, it's junk compared to books go. And we're turning it into a real book. It's effective. But we raised 10 million with this concept. So you can go and do it, but the idea is when you're sitting with someone, I would bulldog them with, hey, I wrote this ebook. Blah, 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 the 14 reasons or the 10 reasons or the 20 reasons why you should do this. And they will see you as an expert immediately. Yeah, yeah don't rip them off verbatim, but yeah, definitely. <laughs> don't reinvent the wheel either, right? I mean, that's, but I think that's, yeah, appreciate that. Just got a few more minutes. Here. Okay, a few more minutes. We have, I have another question here. Yes, sir. So Keith um, mentioned also, what typical private lender describe him or her? Age, situation in life, what do you guys see? Right? You don't want to waste time if somebody's not going to be interested in this. So what is the perfect? No, I don't advertise on, on Snapchat for millennials. No, I look for somebody basically 45 and above because mostly what we're looking for is old 401ks to work with and someone who's put 20 years into the job market is going to have some of that available to be able to piece together. Whereas someone who's fresh out in their 20s, or early 30s, or if they're in their early 30s, they're probably just starting their family. They're probably figuring out how they're going to afford that mortgage. And they may want a side hustle or do something on the side, but private lending doesn't put you in Ferraris with bikini models. You know, it's just good old world, tortoise versus the hare, steady, eddy, capital building. So I look for people who are a little more settled down in life. The middle age, like I said, 45 is about the youngest. I started private lending in my late 30s. So on my Facebook ads, I will go down to 35 just in case there's like that one hotshot lawyer kid 
Yeah, 35 year old is a kid to me, just to let you guys know. And if or he or she wants to get into it, I definitely do that. But definitely, like Mitch says, most of his lenders are going to be retired people. They're out of the game. They want a decent return, but they don't want to have to work too hard for it, you know, and they want it secured so that he kind of fits that you mold. Don't go to the real estate club to go find people to do this because they're all mm. looking to be you. But I did learn something from one of my ex partners, Sam, who I did my first 450 deals with. And so here's what I like to say. Take the people that don't have money that are easy to access and practice your pitch with them. Get them to understand it. And then at the end when they say, well, that'd be great if I really had any money, he says, well, I understand, but don't you know someone that needs this kind of help? And then they refer you to your dad or their uncle. Well, my dad's rich or my uncle's rich, and then you get them to bring them to the table. It's taken a two-step process to get it done, but one, you get your jitters out of your presentation with someone who doesn't really matter, and then at the end, you ask them, well, I'm saying they don't matter because they don't have the money. <laughs> I mean, you can fall on your face for them and it not feel so bad, you know, because... And then you say, well, I don't know, is it someone in your family has a retirement plan, they're sick and tired of living by the ticker tape, or sick and tired of getting one, half a percent, and then you get a referral from them, and that referral gets brought in by their nephew or their... Son and they're selling point. for you basically at that point. Yeah. Well, here's something funny. One of my private lenders is a stockbroker. Oh, yeah. He goes, How is this possible? He said, I'm a hero if I get my client 6%. There you go. So Take my call. I want to talk to him, please. <laughs> Seriously. Please, because I would love to interview somebody. A very good friend of my father's that works for Merrill Lynch. And yeah. so I've had you know lunch and breakfast with him. And he says, Well, look, I can't recommend anything right. that Merrill Lynch doesn't deem from on high. And I personally. SEC's got government written all over it. I mean, let's say you don't want to mess with them, but as far as creating a fund and being able to advertise and all that and having only accredited investors and so on and so forth. In my peer group, retired military guys, mm -hmm. age 45 to 50, mm -hmm. we have the TSP that we contributed to while we're on active duty through payroll deduction. Mm -hmm. Now, once you retire, you can never contribute to it again. Correct. And so it has to be unless you just leave it in there and ride the stock market. Mm -hmm. uh, I was thinking what would be the approach because they've got to convert it to something. I'll tell you, look, right now, look, we've had a hell of a run here. We've got, what, nine, ten years of a nice bull market run, and you can attribute it to whoever or blame it on whoever. It doesn't matter to me. The point being, I'm only looking at the facts, not the politics, that, look, you know, we're coming up due for a market cycle. So wouldn't it be a great time to just go ahead and put that back and lock in what, five, six, seven, eight percent? As a private lender, I like to hear bigger numbers, but you can negotiate anything. The terms are more important than the percentage or the interest rate. But yeah, I would come to them and like, okay, so how far is it going to fall this time for you? You know, how long is it going to take? One of my old jobs, we had the guy come in and he was one of these classic, stay in the market, stay in the market. And so he gave this great spiel about how if you stayed in the market, you see all this would happen. I was like, yeah, but from 2001 to 2011, you were flat. You lost a decade basically in the market. Like, your growth, your losses just wiped each other, balance each other out. So you might not get a flat line, but you can get 6, 8, 12, 10, whatever percentage a year, year over year, and you don't have to work your money that hard. You look, I don't mind if people like you guys or Mitch get a bonus for doing a good job. I really don't because it keeps you guys successful and going. When people at Lehman Brothers or Goldman Sachs get a bonus, it's like, really? If I screw up in my job, I don't get a bonus. I can tell you that right now. I don't know how you guys work, but when I screw up, I don't get money for it. So that's how I would say, look, you can't time the market, but we all know it's coming. So if it looks like a duck and it walks like a duck, maybe it sounds like one too. Ethan, yeah. Have to wrap up. Okay. Really thank you for your well, time. no, thank you. Appreciate you guys coming in. Thank you for uh, interacting with me. I appreciate it. And if you could go on your iPhone, the little purple thing right there, the podcast, Private Lender Podcast, you're going to see this ugly blue and turquoise cover art that I paid way too much money for. It's going to look like this with the gold on it. Please go on in there and just give me a rating and review. I'd appreciate it <laughs> so much. Because the more rating and reviews I get, the more uh, people are going to see the podcast and uh, get out there. Private Lender Podcast. And you should have a card in your folders. Keith Baker, that's me. I'd greatly appreciate it. And I hope everybody enjoys themselves. Pat yourselves on the back for coming out here and trying to better yourself and improve your uh, situation. So thanks again, guys. Appreciate it. Well, there you have it, everybody. My first live Q&A Spitfire session. I want to thank Mitch Steven for letting me come in that morning and have a more than 10 minutes, which turned out to be almost 30 minutes. And then we went back out to his ranch with some of his students and prospects. Hung out, had some burgers, dogs, you know, just kind of typical grilling food and kicked it and had a really great time. And I'm glad I was able to 
get a hold of Mitch's audio guy. Thank you for sharing it, Mitch. And thank you, Kirk, for getting that over to me so I can get it into the ears of the Lender Nation. And now that I am back from hiatus, I've been getting a lot of questions, rightfully so, when the Private Lender Academy is going to start because I promoted it, hyped it. And basically what I did was I decided I was going to put a flag in the sand in the future. And that way I would be motivated to accomplish that task and that goal by January of 2019. Well, that didn't happen. And really the reason behind it is I completely underestimated the online commercial e-com marketing stuff. The private lending is, that's the easy stuff, but getting everything, I get a lot of tech overwhelm. I feel like my dad a little bit. I grew up with computers, but there's a lot that has to go into everything. So kind of throttled back and just doing some one-on-one coaching right now with a few students, which I'm enjoying. I hope they are as well. So I think I'm going to keep this model for a little while longer, keep up the podcast, do some coaching with individuals here and there as I continue to build everything and get this tech stuff out of the way. You know, if this is Shark Tank and I can go get money, I could go get people to do all this. But since I'm bootstrapping, this is part of the fun of starting something from scratch and trying to build it. So it's going to take me a lot longer. Hopefully by the end of the year, I'll have something for you guys in by way or in terms of the Private Lender Academy. But for right now, the important thing is that the hiatus is over back on track. You're going to get weekly doses of me, whether you like it or not. And I've got some great interviews lined up. Can't wait to share them with you. So I just want to say thanks again for sharing your time with me today and listening. And I look forward to continuing on with this podcast, communicating with you guys, and hopefully sharing some knowledge and helping you guys out wherever you may need it in the world of private mortgage lending or notes. And until next episode, I wish you all the best and happy and prosperous lending and investing. Thanks so much for listening to this episode of Private Lender Podcast with your host, Keith Baker. For more great content and to stay up to date, visit privatelenderpodcast.com. If you enjoyed today's episode, please rate and review, and we'll catch you next time.